want to begin by uh, welcoming all of you that are watching uh, our broadcast at, at the uh, Blue Valley campuses and at the Olathe campus and also at the Lee Summit campus. And would ask all of you, if you would, to open your Bibles to Psalms 121. And uh, I, I want to start off today in honor of uh, Father's Day by helping all you dads out. You know, one of the things that dads are supposed to do is tell lame jokes. And uh, I know this here at OP, Jack's been laid up with surgery. You haven't heard a lame joke for several weeks. And so I, I'm going to equip you. One of the exciting things about having granddaughters, I get to bring the lame jokes out and recycle them. But uh, let me tell you this story. There was a, uh, a big bear, and he walked into a diner to order lunch. And he walked up to the counter, and he said, yeah, I want uh, a double cheeseburger, french fries, and a uh, large Coke. And the guy behind the counter said, what, what's with the paws? And he said, what do you expect? I'm a bear. <laughs> it's a slow, it's a slow groan as it moves across. All right. All right. Let's move on. Uh, today, in I uh, hope the rest of the sermon goes a little better. Today in Psalms 121, we pick up our study in the Psalms of Ascent. Psalms chapter 120 through 134 are actual songs which God's people sang together three times a year as they ascended to Jerusalem to worship and celebrate God in a great week of festival reunion and fellowship and feasting. And uh, as we said last week, these triannual pilgrimages, their ascent into the presence of God in the holy city, it's a metaphor for our Christian life. Because all of us have also been called to journey out of our temporal worldly lives towards God. The purpose of these songs of ascent was to prepare the hearts of the pilgrims for worship when they arrived at the temple. And, and it did that by reminding them first of, of all that God is and all that He's revealed Himself to be and also all that He had done for them and to try with, with that as perspective, with that truth come to them to give them some divine perspective on all the trials and challenges of their everyday lives. And friends, today as the Lord's disciples, it is right and it is very helpful to us to uh, study and remember all these truths, this revelation about who God is and what He's done, and to sing these songs as we too are daily ascending. We're moving step by step closer and closer toward the presence of God. Now today we're going to be focusing on Psalms 121, and then we're going to take a brief look in the middle of the message, at, <clears throat> toward the end of the message, at Psalms 124, both of which have this in common, they describe God as our helper. And specifically today, we're going to see five ways that God helps us on our spiritual journey. And appropriately, since today's Father's Day, we've entitled this message, A Portrait of the Perfect Father. This psalm is for everyone. But especially today, I, I want all of you dads to be uh, challenged. And I also want you to be blessed by the character and the deeds of your heavenly Father. Psalms 121 begins, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Now picture in your mind's eye a group of pilgrims traveling to Jerusalem for one of those festivals. Everyone's head is down at this moment as they cautiously traverse the rocky and treacherous paths. Step by step, they're moving upward. They're ascending to Jerusalem. And one of the pilgrims stops for a moment to catch a breath, because that's what you do when you're doing these long climbs, right? And he looks up and, and he scans the hills. He scans the mountains, the, the range in front of him, in anticipation of all that awaits him before he arrives at Jerusalem. The Hebrew word here for help, ezar, de describes a helper or an assistant. The word is often used of a military ally. Ezar is actually the word that Genesis uses to describe what Eve was to be to Adam, the kind of relationship. She was to be his helper, his ally. But all travel in those days, especially in the mountains, through the hills, was fraught with peril. The footing was typically unsure. Shade could be hard to find. One's food for the journey, and especially one's water for the journey, had to be carefully rationed. 
And always there is the danger of wild animals and of robbers and thieves. And so as our pilgrim stops and he, he scans the path, he scans the horizon ahead of him, he's looking in part for all the possible dangers that could be there. And there are many. But before he is tempted to give in to fear, all fear is quickly banished by his verse 1 confession that his help comes from the Lord. And here's the thing, today as you scan the horizon of your life, if you have your eyes open, you will surely see many very real possible hazards and dangers awaiting around the corner. And if you are a wise person, you'll be like this pilgrim. You will acknowledge that somewhere along the way in the days ahead, I'm, I'm going to need some help. There's going to be things that I can't handle on my own. And then just like this pilgrim some 3,000 years ago, you must avoid the temptation to give in to fear or anxiety. You must not be duped by the lies of the world and look to the wisdom of men, the wisdom of the world. You must not trust in the strength of any broken and fragile man. You must not put your trust, your ultimate trust in any science of man or the education systems of men or the governments of men or even in your closest family and friends because they're all so limited in how they can help you. You see, by faith, we too confess with the pilgrim, and we should be singing out with God's people, my help, it comes from the Lord. Who is he? The maker of heaven and earth. And I want you to think about that. Who would you rather have helping you as you make this walk in your life? Psalm 46 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Now, these two psalms, as I said, they lay out five specific ways that God helps. And I want you to notice the first thing is that God secures our steps. Verse 3 says, He will not let your foot be moved. The truth is, most of the roads and pathways of ancient Judea were just loose dirt, beat down dirt and rocks, especially in the mountain passes between Jericho and Jerusalem. It was, it was very easy to have a slip or a fall, which could result in serious injury, even in some places death, if you fell at the wrong place. If you've ever hiked on a steep mountain, you know the perils of not having sure footing. Furthermore, everyone who came from Galilee to Jerusalem, you either had to walk way around or somewhere, you had to cross over the frightful valley of the shadow, and it was treacherous. It's alluded to in Psalms 23. Also, you would have to travel eventually on that Jericho road upon which the traveler in the parable of the Good Samaritan was attacked and stripped and beaten and left for dead by robbers. And always and throughout history, that road has been a dangerous place. There's been robbers lurking there. Always in ancient times, travel was dangerous. You avoided it if you could. You always traveled in groups and you never traveled at night. Now, if you and I take these poetic metaphors of the Psalms, if we take them too literally, we will both miss the point that God is trying to make to us, and I think eventually somewhere along the way you're going to be bitterly disappointed in God. You see, God does on occasion providentially sit, get off his throne from heaven. He, he, he comes and he intervenes literally in our physical lives. He does that sometimes. But the Psalms are primarily focused on spiritual and not physical realities. Jesus told us, in this world, you will have trouble. That's one of the promises of Scripture that we don't all often uh, cling to. The truth is that there are faithful Christians who have lots of trials and troubles in their life. They have challenges. They face frightful calamities. Any of us, no matter what your relationship to Christ, can suffer in a car wreck or an athletic uh, emergency or some injury. In the last month, I was, I was just doing a little list, and I was just thinking, in the last month here at Legacy, and this is pretty typical for a, a church that has, you know, uh, well over 2,000 members, uh, just in the last month, we've had people that had to be rushed to the hospital to have emergency surgeries. We've had others who have lost loved ones, and we've had funerals, and we've had others who received bad diagnosis and indicating to them that their time here on earth that's left is very short. And then there have been others, including young people, that have received the news that, that they're going to live a normal lifetime, but just like Paul, they're going to live the rest of their days managing some thorn in the flesh. 
just in the last, last month. We've had members lose businesses. We've had members lose jobs. We've had members whose house was hit by a tornado. We've had people seriously injure themselves falling out of cars, out of bed, and off of ladders, right? And someone said, really? I go, yeah, really. Now, I can tell you one thing. I am never going to hurt myself falling off a ladder. That's not going to happen, <laughs> right? You have to get on a ladder to fall off a ladder. <laughs> it's not going to happen. But listen, those things are just facts. And, and don't think that God's promised that none of things is going to happen to you. Nothing bad's going to happen to you in your life. He's never made that promise. But his promises are sure and his words are true. And he says here he's going to secure our steps. But the securing of our steps here, it doesn't mean that God's never going to allow any physical calamity to happen to us contrary to the heretical teaching of so many of the health and wealth charlatans that masquerade as Christian pastors in today's world. God's concern in your life is spiritual. It's about your spiritual walk toward him. That's what he's concerned about, not your temporary sojourn in this world that is passing away. Now, I think God has sympathy for us when we are hurting, like any parent, but he has eternal perspective on things. We shouldn't try to put him into our mindset and make him serve us. God's goal today for your life in the here and now, you know what his goal is? His goal is to redeem everything that happens to you. His goal is to redeem everything you're going to go through. He wants to give meaning and a purpose to all of your, this is what Jesus called your light and momentary troubles. I'm going to talk to the Lord about that when we get to heaven. I don't think some of them are that light and momentary, right? But I suspect when I'm there, from his perspective, I'll see it. God wants everything you go through to move you toward his ultimate purposes for your life. And that is that you would glorify him through every experience and that through every experience, a work would take place, the spirit would work and move you toward full sanctification and full restoration of his image in your life. And, and here's the ultimate purpose of God, that we would be fully conformed to the image of his son. Because then and only then will we be fit and prepared to enter and live and worship eternally in the new Jerusalem. So God does and God will secure all of our spiritual steps. He won't allow us to get off that path. Throughout Holy Scripture, the Christian life is referred to as a walk, the metaphor of walk, of us ever moving forward, ever moving onward toward God. Uh, and this is, the, this, is, this is the thing that throughout Scripture, it, it, we're moving, we're on a walk with God. And every earthly choice we make, it actually represents another spiritual step toward the Lord. We're to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which we've received. We're to walk in love. We're to walk by faith. We are, uh, as God's promise, as we continue walking toward him, then he who began a good work in us will complete it. And friends, any time and, and every time you falter or you stray or, or maybe you begin to stray from the path or you stub your toe, God is going to begin to work again to bring you back onto the right path. He's working to make us both will and, and, and do what is right. And we must all by faith be determined to walk as children of the light, seeking to do what pleases God. This metaphor reveals that God's people are on a journey which is not the same journey as the rest of the world around us. Consequently, we need some provisions that the rest of the world doesn't need because they're not on the same journey we are. We need some equipment to make our way and this provision, these equipment, these, these are the values of the daily habits, the disciplines that all spiritual pilgrims through the ages have had to, to acquire in order to complete their journey toward God. And we preached about these before, and, and we'll do it again, but let me just say this for now. All of them center. They all begin and end. They're all centered on the Word of God, on what God has spoken to us, the, the living words of God. When we hear the word of God, faith comes. 
When we trust the Word of God, power is released. When we obey the Word of God, when we are abiding in the Word of God, our prayers are answered. When we are living God's Word, we make progress on our journey. The psalmist says, how can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it or keeping it according to your word. He then says, with my whole heart I will seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And later, he says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. You see, the promise of God is not that you're never going to have an accident or an illness, that you're not going to ever have any tragedy in this world. The promise of God is that even when those things come, and even when you make mistakes and you stumble and falter, if you're walking according to God's word, if that's your heart, he's going to secure your steps. Because nothing can separate us from his love, and nothing can thwart his ultimate purpose for our lives. Now here's the second way that, that God helps us. He, he shades us from perils. Verse 5 says, The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand, so the sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. Now, I've done a lot of uh, meditation on this concept of shade this week. I did a lot of reading about this concept, and I'll tell you that nobody knows for sure. No one knows exactly what the psalmist had in mind when he, when he kind of paints this image of, of the Lord being our shade. But literally, the image that's being painted here is that, that you're a child walking toward Jerusalem for the celebration, and you're out in the Judean wilderness, and the sun's beating down on you, but you've got a big, strong father, and he's walking on your right side. And which side would you rather be on, the shade side or the sun side? And you just stay in dad's shadow and the trip is way easier. That's literally the image here. What's interesting is that um, the daytime heat in the Judean wilderness, especially during certain parts of the year, can be extremely perilous to dehydrated travelers. In that arid climate, uh, travelers needed to take advantage of any bit of shade they could find. In certain places and certain times, it was hard to find, especially uh, traveling at night under the shade of the moon, uh, the threat that would be posed by falls and wild animals and robbers was constant. And in our journey of Christian discipleship, there are many external perils out there. Metaphorically, shadows or shade, it's kind of interesting, it usually in the Bible, when it usually has a negative connotation, like the valley of the shadow of death. Man, usually if you're in the light, you're, you're in righteousness and you're in God's blessing and the darkness is where bad stuff happens and it's not good. But the one exception to that is, is the shadow of God. Because always in the Psalms, when we walk in the shadow of God, it's a wonderful thing, it's a delightful thing. In Psalm 17, David prayed, Oh God, hide me in the shadow of your wings. The shadow of his wings is a place of absolute safety. It's a place of rest and refuge. In Psalms 91, uh, the psalmist writes, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. If you take this metaphor a little further, there's an interesting thing about being in the shadow or the shade. Sometimes in the shade, you can see things more clearly than you can in the light. This is an interesting thing. If you're outside the light and you're looking into the shade, you can't see at all what's in there. You're bl it's blind to you. But if you're in the shade looking out at those things that are in the light, you can see them more clearly. This is why when you're in the sun, you squint your eyes or you wear sunglasses. We try to protect ourselves from the rays of the sun. Well, I think this is the point. Often, the false gods and the idols of this world. When we get outside the shadow of Jesus, of God, often these idols, they shine so brightly in our eyes that they blind us to things. We, we see them so clearly, they're so attractive to us that they blind us to all the dangers and realities around them. There are many scholars believe that the sun and the moon here, that these things are, are that we need shade from, 
that they metaphorically are specific references to certain religions, to certain idols, and to maybe false gods in general. Psalm 121, the moment it was written, there was a big struggle in the land of Israel, whether they were going to be God's people or whether they were going to go the way of the Canaanites and the pagan religions. And metaphorically, uh, this, it's not, literally, this land at this point, Israel was polluted by all kinds of worship of pagan gods. And usually those worship of pagan gods, it happened on the high places, up on the top of hills. On the top of hills, they would erect these poles, these Asherah poles, and they would build shrines, and they would set up groves of trees to invite people and to show them where to come. And when you got there, there would be uh, priestess or priest, priests who were actually prostitutes. And the Canaanite religions, you, you worshipped by having sexual relations, all kinds of perverse things with these prostitutes. And when you did that, when, when you did that, you paid and you did that, you, th you were given a blessing and you could procure help and protection from the evil things that would attack you, the things you were afraid of. And if you feared the sunlight, you could go to the shrine and pray to the sun god and get protection from the sun. And if you feared any night demons, you could go to a high place that was dedicated to the moon goddess and maybe you could buy a charm or an amulet and and uh, God's people were told, don't do these. And at this time, God kept raising up prophets, and they would shake their fingers in the face of the judges and the kings, saying, tear these things down. They are polluting the land. But you see, not only does God protect us from external hazards, but internal ones as well. Because the plain truth is that in our fallen state, all of our hearts are prone to chase after idols. And we want to run to the hills for our help. But when God stands between you and the sun, it enables you to see those idols for what they truly are. And they're not going to help you. They're going to accelerate your way to destruction. In Psalms 115, the word proclaims their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. That God didn't reveal himself to us this way. Someone made this from their mind and fashioned it with their hands. And these gods... They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not feel. Feet, but they do not walk. And, and not a sound is in their throat. They are impotent. They are powerless. They are false. And those who make them, they become like them, blind and, and deaf and dumb. Their brains fall out. And so are those who trust in them. They're led to destruction. You know, we read about these ancients and how they would make a god and then they would worship and sacrifice even their children sometimes to these gods. And, and we scoff at such idolatry. Well, what, how could people be so stupid? But friends, you step back and look at your life and we clearly have our own hilltop shrines. We all have things that shine brightly in our eyes and they capture our attention, but they're out of the shadow of God. And every day we're making all these sacrifices to them. We, we sacrifice our time, we sacrifice our energy, we sacrifice our resources, all in the hope of, of getting back from these things a blessing of wealth, of health, of pleasure, of power, of security, of strength, of status and popularity. And this is what we do. Luke and I were talking this week about this, and I, I think, I haven't, fully tested this, but I think this is a theme that's going to come up again as we go through Psalms. But I think there's a major difference between Christian worship, Judeo-Christian worship, the worship of the one true God as he's revealed himself, and all other worship that's pagan. And I think this is it. When the worshiper of the pagan gods came to worship, he came and he gave something in order to get something. He came to do something, to go through a ritual, to go through a ceremony, to pay a, a price, to participate in something so that he could walk away and he could get something that would make his life better, that would help him achieve his goals and his dream and his vision. And friends, biblical worship's not like that. In biblical worship, you don't come to get, you come to give. In biblical worship, we, we come and, and the truth that God has revealed himself to us to be this kind of God and he's done these things and we recognize 
that He's already given His all for us. And our worship is all about just giving Him thanks and giving Him praise for what He's already done. And, and if you come to church and, and walk out and say, well, I didn't get anything out of it, or if you come to church hoping to get something out of it, listen, that's pagan thinking. It's not Christian thinking. Christians gather to thank the God who has already given all. I hope you get something out of it. I, I think if you come and give, God will bless and, and you'll walk out blessed. But that's not the goal. That's not the purpose. And that's not the question. The question is, did you worship? Did you give to God who gave his only son to die for your sins, who's already paid your way into heaven? Are we giving him our best? Eugene Peterson writes, all the water in the oceans cannot sink a ship unless it gets inside. Nor can all the trouble in the world harm us unless it gets within us. It's when it starts polluting our hearts and our minds. Friends, when we trust in the Lord, He becomes this protective shade that guards our hearts and our minds. He helps us see the world for what it is. He prevents the world's water from, from which, which surrounds us, which we're floating in. We can't get out of it, but He prevents it from getting into our boat where it will destroy us. Now, just for a quick minute, I want you to turn the page in your Bibles to Psalms 124. I want you to flip over to 124 which is also all about how God helps, how he helps his people. By the way, uh, many people believe that this was a, a call and response psalm where the worship leader would sing a line and then the people, maybe the men would do a line and the women would do a line and then all the people would respond personalizing and affirming. He would pronounce a truth that God had spoken and they would sing back and personalize and affirm the truth for themselves. And... Uh, I don't know exactly if this is how this would broke out, but, but in your mind, picture those people climbing the thing uh, up toward Jerusalem, and maybe one of the leaders, maybe a Levite who was traveling with them, calls out, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, I mean, think where our life would be if God had not been with us. And then he says, let Israel now say, and all the people respond, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when people rose against us, then they would have swallowed us alive when their anger was kindled against us, when the flood would have swept us away, the torrent would have gone over us, and then over us would have gone the raging waters. And maybe the leader sings back in verse 6, Oh, blessed be the Lord who has not given us his prey to their teeth. And the people affirm, We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord. And it tells us again who he is, who made heaven and earth. Here in Psalms 124, our perfect father shields us from our enemies. While all of us face the perils of nature, and there's the perils of idolatry, the plain truth is sometimes our greatest dangers come from just evil people, people who have sold out. All of God's people throughout biblical history uh, have had enemies who were bent on their destruction. Moses fought the Egyptians and the Pharaohs. Joshua, all the tribes of Cana. David had to run for years from Saul and later from his own son, Absalom. Jesus and all the apostles, they had bitter enemies who tried to destroy their lives and their ministries. And it was Jesus who said to us in John 15, 19, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master, and if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. In fact, in Luke 6, 26, Jesus went beyond that. He said, woe to you. Woe to you, cursed are you when all people speak well of you. For so their fathers did to the false prophets. In 2 Timothy 3.12, Paul reiterates this principle that Jesus taught. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus. Listen, you don't even have to do it perfectly. If you just walk around with a desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, you will be persecuted 
in this world. My friends, that's, that's just a fact that if you're going to follow Christ, it's part of counting the cost. You need to recognize you're not going to fit in here and the world's not going to like you. It's not going to approve of you. You're going to have enemies in this world. You're going to have people that don't like you, that speak against you. If we follow Jesus, we're probably going to have more of them than we would. I think everybody has them, but we're going to have more of them. And we just know that sometimes they're going to tell lies about us, and sometimes they're going to spin things and twist things, and they're going to say bad stuff about us, and sometimes, and, and we see that they have, and they continue, they do way worse than just talk about us. And so we all need to understand this, and frankly, if you're a dad and you're a parent, one of the things that you've got to do, you can't raise snowflake kids. If you're going to follow Christ, you need to understand that you're not, you're not going to fit here and you're going to have enemies and, and you're going to have these in your life and, and you want to protect them when they're, when they're young, but you also want to equip them to live in that world. We need to help them and grow up and be what Jesus commanded us all to be, not to be foolish and naive victims, but to be wise as serpents, but as, as innocent as dove. We, we're wise on the outside, but we keep our soft hearts. That's what Jesus wants. But you see, the good news is, God is always watching over us. And here's a fact about the physical world. Nothing is ever going to happen to any of the children of God in this world that he does not allow. I mean, he could step in and prevent it, right? So nothing's going to happen that he hasn't said, I'm going to allow this. And nothing is ever going to happen to any of us that he cannot work through it to bring glory to himself, to even martyrdom, he can bring glory to himself and, and also, here's the promise, for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. But you know, throughout my life and throughout all of biblical history, sometimes so that he might be glorified and so that his children could learn some really, really hard, deep spiritual truths, he has allowed us to walk through fire but he always uses it. He uses it. it he gives us a platform. He, he uses it to burn away the dross in our life. He uses our, the suffering to pull us closer to himself. And listen, sometimes God does it. He lets us walk through the fire. I, I don't like it. I don't want to do it again. But I look back at my life and he's, he's allowed me to go through, through those things and I see his hand in it. I see the platform that I never would have had. I see the things that are now true of me that never would have been true had I not suffered those things. And so I don't always like it, but I want Jesus to be Lord and I trust him. Here's my testimony. Uh, it is true that sometimes God intervenes and fights my battles for me uh, sometimes he lets me go to the fire, but sometimes he does get involved. And what I know is that time and time again, when people rose up against me, when they would have swallowed me alive, when their anger was kindled against me, when I found myself in a flood about to be swept away, when I was sinking under torrents of raging water, God helped me to escape like a bird from a snare. And the Lord who is the maker of heaven and earth, is my shield against my enemies. David said it this way in Psalms 28, 7. The Lord is my strength and my shield, and him my heart trusts, and I am helped. And then what do we do? We worship. My heart exalts, and with my song, I give thanks to him. Now turn back to Psalms 121. Number four, <clears throat> he saves our lives from evil. The Hebrew root word, I'm, I'm using the word save, but the Hebrew root there is to keep, or the, the noun the, is keeper. The word is shamar, and it describes one who guards or provides diligent and watchful care, one who's very carefully watching. This is the main word of the psalm. It, it appears in some form or another in verse 3, in verse 4, in verse 5, in verse 7, and in verse 8. It describes a competent watchman, a, a, a security guard who's diligent. He's a good one. A caring shepherd over his sheep or a loving parent. All of us are, are keepers who fill any of those roles. 
I want you to uh, watch this clip. This, is, this clip is called Dad Saves. I thought it'd be good for us for this point in Father's Day. Watch this clip. All right, <laughs> that's exactly what dads are supposed to do, right? Dad saves. That's a, a, about a minute and a half of a 20-minute clip if you want to go watch that. It's pretty good. Listen, this is also exactly what our perfect father does for us all the time. He is our keeper. And every single day he saves us from so many physical and spiritual seen and unseen dangers. I can't wait to get to heaven and watch the highlight clips of how many times God did something like that for you and for me and for my brother. It's going to be a great clip, right? <laughs> great clip. I love the old gospel hymn. I feel the touch of the hands of hands so kind and tender. They're leading me in paths that I must trod. I'll have no fear for Jesus walks beside me for I'm sheltered in the arms of God. So let the storms rage high, the dark clouds rise, they don't worry me, for I am sheltered safe within the arms of God. He walks with me, and naught of earth shall harm me, for I am sheltered in the arms of God. Finally, number five, our perfect Father shepherds us, and He does it constantly. Listen to the constancy of God in Psalms. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. For the Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Let me close with one encouragement and one word of exhortation to all of our fathers. Men, the first thing is, you need to always remember that God is your helper. The call to be a father is an absolutely awesome and frightful duty. But men of faith, men who are on a pilgrimage with Jesus, men who daily are ascending toward God, they never have to do anything alone. We don't have to be dads alone. For the Lord who made heaven and earth is your helper. And so every day you need to acknowledge that he's there and you need to lean into him. Secondly, you need to remember that God is your model. He's your example to follow. And every day you should seek in every way to follow his example, to show your children the love and the character of God and the way you live. And, and then with all the strength and all the wisdom uh, from his word, with all the resources that he provides for you, not just physically, but spiritually, it is your job as a dad to secure your child's steps, to shade them from peril, to shield them from enemies, to keep or, or save them from all evil and diligently and lovingly shepherd them constantly. And those are awesome duties, right? 
But with that said, here's a fact that, that we got to face. The fact are that none of us are God, the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, right? We don't have that kind of power. We don't, we're not omniscient. We're not omnipresent. We're not omnipotent. And the truth is none of us are or ever will be perfect fathers. And so dad's even more important than being a great dad your far higher calling, your far greater responsibility is that every single day of your life you would point your children to Jesus, that you would personally introduce them to the Lord who is your strong helper and your perfect model. We're going we're gonna to close right now in, in, in just a second, and uh, what I want to do is ask all the uh, prayer warriors at all the campuses if you would make your way to the foot of the cross. And I, I don't know what God is doing in your heart today, but if you've come in here today and you don't know Jesus and, and uh, you want to know Jesus, I want to encourage you wherever you are to go to the foot of the cross and there's someone there that would be happy to pray with you and introduce you to Jesus. And if you have any other business that God is, is working in your heart to do, don't leave this room. Find someone, talk to someone. You can go to the cross. You can find someone around you. Find one of the pastors. And, and don't leave this place today without doing your business with God. Would you please stand? And uh, at all of our campuses, I'm going to ask you to stand. And um, this is going to be our benediction for the service. Father, we thank you so much that you are our perfect Father. And Father, I, I am thankful that you are my helper. You who made the heaven and the earth, you are my helper. You are my keeper. You are my shade. And, and Father, I just, I just pray that we would every day remember those truths so that we would not fear all the perils of the world. You are in control. And you are moving and working through all things to, to, to make us who we need to be so that we can be part of heaven's glory. And Father, I ask a special blessing today on, on all of our fathers. I pray, Lord, you'd make us very aware of the responsibilities we carry, but Lord, also again, of the resources that we have, and you would help us to keep our eyes on you, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.